My name is Regina Gouvernier. I'm president of the League of Women Voters for Port Washington and Manhasset, and I'm delighted to see so many of you here this evening. As you know, our local league, state, and national leagues are nonpartisan. We do not support or oppose any political party or candidate. Our mission is to engage you, the voters, in giving all candidates for a given office a public space to answer questions in a structured way while maintaining civil discourse. Thank you to all of the members of our league who have worked so hard to make this event possible. And thank you, the audience, for taking the time and effort to hear and observe the, our candidates tonight. Our voter services work includes forums like this, voter registration, and more. We also educate voters and advocate with legislators on election reforms, the Equal Rights Amendment, protecting the environment, and health care reform. We only take positions on issues after studying them extensively. We hope you'll consider joining the League. And membership forms are available on the table, or the QR code will bring up the, um, take you to the website. And our website is called LWV of PWM. Remember, the League is not for women only, so please join. Now, uh, just to let you know what goes on here, before um, anybody, se several people stop by this table and ask questions, but know that as more questions occur to you, you can, all, you can raise your hand, and one of our league members, um, Nikki Willard, will be walking around and giving out index cards and pencils for those who wish to submit additional questions and we'll pick them up so that nobody has to climb over other people in order to submit a question. Um, Bella Wang, our moderator, is in charge uh, for this forum, and she's the arbiter of all decisions going forward. Bella, the podium is yours. Thank you, Regina. You're welcome. So if you were at our previous forum, you're gonna hear a lot of words that are similar. Bear with me. For over a century, the League of Women Voters has sought to make democracy work by holding events like this so that voters like you can hear and views and observe the behavior of candidates on a range of issues relevant to this community. This is why we ensure all candidates agree to the debate procedures. Further, by being here tonight, you, as the audience, have also agreed, as noted on the large posters, one over there, and there was one outside. The League has used procedures like these for over 60 years to ensure fair process and encourage civil discourse. I will now read the rules out loud. This will take about three minutes, so please bear with me. First, the moderator will be a member of the League from outside of the district. I live in New York City. Second, candidates' opening statements will be determined by drawing lots before in-person events. The same order will be for opening and closing statements. So in this case, Ms. DeSena will speak first and Mr. Kamen will speak last. Each candidate will be allowed three minutes for an opening statement. Four, after all candidates have spoken, the moderator will open the meeting with questions from the audience. Cards will be handed out for written questions. These will be vetted prior to asking so that duplicative, personal, abusive, or biased questions can be discarded. Fifth, the moderator, that's me, will be the arbiter of whether questions are appropriate, repetitive, or abusive. Six, each candidate will be given one and a half minutes to answer each question. At the moderator's discretion, the time for a response may be reduced as long as it is the same for everyone. There will be no rebuttal. Questions may be addressed to a specific candidate or to candidates in general, although all candidates will be given an opportunity to answer any question addressed to a specific individual. Seven, the moderator will attempt to rotate the order of responses for each question. Eight, a league member will act as timekeeper, one half minute from the end of any given time period, the timekeeper will alert the speaker by a prearranged signal. So Marie, please hold up the signs to demonstrate. That's the 30 second warning uh, and then the stop. When the time is up, the speaker will be allowed to finish the sentence. Repeatedly speaking past the deadline may re result in a candidate losing time for a future question or for others getting additional time. Nine, candidates will have two minutes for a closing statement. 10, since the purpose of the meeting is to determine the candidate's views, no substitute speaker will be allowed to appear should a candidate be unable to attend in person. No written or recorded statement may be provided in lieu of active participation by a candidate. Using props, charts, or visuals or displaying campaign literature is also prohibited. 
Finally, in accordance with league policy, the league owns the content of its forums. Audio or video recording by authorized members of the media will be permitted only if agreed upon by all candidates present. The league maintains the right to record the forum and publish it on LWV controlled electronic sites. No other recording will be allowed. No partial transcript or recording may be published without written permission from the league. So as moderator, I will be the arbiter of all decisions during the debate. And the league believes that the responsibility for maintaining good government procedures rests on you, the voters. So we have a few expectations for you as well. First, be sure that your cell phones are turned off or silenced, and please do not do block the doors, which are back there, or the camera, which is right there. Second, your purpose, <laughs> see, there we go, no phones. Uh, second, your purpose is to hear from candidates, so let's focus on their, oh, wow, a lot of phones. <laughs> no more phones. Uh, <laughs> let's focus on th their voices, not yours. Third, please remain seated and silent during the Q&A unless you are writing or submitting question cards, which again, there's a table there. League members will also be coming up and down the aisles in case some, uh, with post no cards in case you need it. As moderator, I will stop the debate if the audience interrupts. Interruptions reduce the time for candidates to speak, and we are here to listen to them. Four, to repeat, league policy permits only authorized recordings of these forums. Taking clips or segments is not authorized. North Shore TV is broadcasting this forum, and the league will post it as well on our LWV of PWM YouTube channel long before the election. Lastly, any audience member who violates the agreed procedures for the forum or who disrupts the forum by ignoring these audience expectations after being warned may be asked to leave. So now we will hear from the candidates vying to be your town supervisor for the next two years, Jen, John, sorry, Jen DeSena and John Kamen. When the candidates arrived, they drew straws for speaking order. Ms. DeSena will be going first for opening remarks as well as for closing. Mr. Kamen will be going second for opening remarks as well as closing. So I will ask the audience to applaud briefly after each opening statement and then hold all of applause and other responses until after the closing statements. So, Ms. DeSena, please begin. Okay, thank you. Oh, I've been speaking to this, there we go. Okay. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you for joining us tonight at this meet and greet. Thank you to the Port Washington Manhasset League of Women Voters for setting this event up and hosting us here tonight. I'm proud to be a member of the league as well. I'm your town supervisor, Jen DeSena, and I'm eager to engage in a thoughtful discussion about the future of our amazing town. In these challenging times, leadership is not just about making promises, but about delivering results. Throughout my tenure as town supervisor, I've been committed to working tirelessly for the betterment of North Hempstead. I've collaborated with local stakeholders listened to the concerns of our residents, and taken action to create positive change. In my first term in office, I provided some much needed taxpayer relief by delivering two budgets in a row that contained significant tax cuts and delivered on my pledge to recommit the town to investing in our infrastructure, while also reducing the town's reliance on borrowing and debt. And over the course of my first term, I've advanced a number of long stalled projects that will significantly improve the quality of life of our residents while boosting our downtowns. I've brought honesty, integrity, and transparency to a town that was no stranger to corruption and mismanagement before I took office. For that reason, I successfully installed four members into defined and staggered terms on the town's Board of Ethics, restoring independence and autonomy from any potential outside influence. On top of this, to bring additional sunlight to government operations, I directed the town's Government Access TV channel to begin rebroadcasting town board meetings daily, something that had never been done before. I also took the unprecedented step to call for an independent audit of the town's building department by the Nassau County Controller to help expose the problems that flourished under my opponent's watch and continued to plague the town for nearly 20 years. Over a year later, this audit is still ongoing and I look forward to the final report. It's my pleasure to join you all tonight and I look forward to this opportunity to discuss our differences, share my vision, 
and hear your concerns. Together, we can ensure that North Hempstead remains a place where families thrive, businesses prosper, and our community remains strong. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Cam, would you begin your uh, opening statement? Uh, <clears throat> thank you and good evening. Uh, I would like to thank the League of Women Voters for holding this debate. Uh, I'd like to thank the church for hosting it. Uh, I'd like to thank Newsday for endorsing me today. Uh, I really think that's a special endorsement and I appreciate it. I, you know, I'm coming back, I'm running for North Hempstead Supervisor uh, because I believe that local government is really a critical uh, place where we can have one of the greatest impacts in our community. We're a town of 237,000 people. It's a diverse town. North Hempstead is uh, on Long Island. It's adjacent to New York City. Uh, it's a place where it has significant challenges just based on its, a, its, its environment, uh, the water system, which is underneath our uh, land where we uh, live on the water. Uh, I've spent years uh, in local government trying to figure out how do we make sure that we respect the, the differences that we have, but by also investing uh, in our community. The things that I've done in the past since I've left, I've worked with uh, recently and currently with Steve Ballone, Suffolk County Executive. I left originally to go work with the governor to uh, respond to Sandy Relief. I had been a former North Hempstead, um, I'm sorry, Nassau County judge, uh, and I was chairman of NIFA. I've had a number of different experiences because in those experiences I've learned how do we serve our community? How do we have an impact on what's going on around us? I've learned that there are many people who I might disagree with, that if we listen to them, if we engage them, we could find better answers. I've learned that all the solutions don't come from political uh, statements, but from the work we do. I've learned that the community that we live in is not only extraordinary because of the people that comprise it, and the natural environment that, from which it exists. But it's an incredible place because the government, the polity that we have, the, the structure of government, the town government, the most common form of government in New York State, is set up so that we can be close to the people and we can have that impact by engaging them uh, on a regular basis, even when we disagree or they disagree with us. I've come back to this position, to run for this position as North Hempstead Supervisor, because the experience that I've had has enabled me to do great things after I left. But I have also can see, as we all can, that the world has changed. We're more polarized nationally. We're more polarized locally. The world has changed in ways that we didn't expect, whether it's through a pandemic, through violence throughout the world. And so the world is different, and I'm different. I've learned from where I've come, and I'm learning as we go. And so I look forward to this debate, I look forward to discussing the issues that are important. I look forward to discussing budgets and, and the impact of the decisions that we make. I hope that the town residents are willing to look deeper into the, into the discussions that we have, the platitudes, the simple answers uh, that sometimes we give. Thank you for the opportunity today. We will now begin with the audience's questions, of which there are many tonight. Please hold all of your applause until the end of the forum. We have assembled to hear from candidates, not from fellow citizens. So the first question goes to Mr. Kamen. In your opinion, and in light of state policies and programs, what are the top three critical issues facing this town? What plans would you put into place to address or mitigate those issues and why, and how would you pay for it, Mr. Kamen? Uh, three critical positions. First, it's, it's budgeting. The, Town finance is always critical, and we need to budget honestly. We need to make sure that we're accounting for the money that we spend. I'm concerned that I don't think that's happening uh, in, in certainly in the current budget that's been presented. I think that the people have a right to know how their money is spent, and I believe that we need to structure our budgets so that uh, the integrity of the budget can be seen by all. Uh, I'm concerned when we uh, defund the government or that we take monies away that's going to affect us in the long term, hurt our bond rating, uh, wipe out services that are critical to us, whether it's senior services, public safety, uh, all these things matter to us. And I think that the, the way we budget really does matter, and I think that we're, we're on the verge of failing that in that, in that area. Infrastructure is critical. Infrastructure is the, the roads, the buildings, uh, the waterways, the, the things that we uh, invest in so that we can 
uh, make sure that we can be safe in how we travel, that we can use the, uh, the monies that we have in, in capital spending in, wisely. Uh, and so I think that's just how we spend critical uh, infrastructure money, and we should be getting money from the state and from the federal government. Third is the environment. You know, we're in a time when climate uh, is challenging all of us. How do we make decisions that impact us in a way that allows us to protect our planet uh, and still fund our government, fund our community, uh, and do it in a rational, meaningful way? So I think those three issues are important. We need to fund them through uh, honest funding. We get state and federal grants. I've gotten $10, $15 million a year through the grants, and I will continue to do that to fund the pro programs that I believe in. Mr. Senator. Um, three positions? Yes. Okay. Um, I, I believe in taxpayer relief. I believe that the people should be allowed to keep their money. So we should not be overtaxing. We should not be collecting excess reserves for us to figure out something to do with down the road. Um, so I, I believe that we should be more accountable and yes, by the way, my budget process is exactly the same as it was under Judy Bosworth and, and, and probably under you. Um, the budget is a, uh, we have a tentative budget. There will be amendments from, from board members and then we will vote on a, 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 a preliminary budget. Um, the idea that the budget I proposed will wipe out services, it's just completely false. And we had a workshop where our commissioners came and spoke about it and answered questions from, from my colleagues on the board. 13 of the 18 departments actually saw an increase in their budget. And the ones that had decreases were because of retirements or you know, change in personnel where the, the successor made less money. Um, the, we actually increased the budget for parks. Project independence has been completely maintained. So th these are false statements. And our highway supervisor came to the workshop and said he got everything he needed. He didn't ask for anything more. So these are false statements that you're making. I've done absolutely nothing to hurt the town. There's been no cut in services. Thank you. This is a question directed to Supervisor DeSena, but both of you can answer. Uh, Mr. DeSena, first, the budget you submitted for 2024 creates a multi-million dollar funding hole that will require steep cuts in services on the future. What services are you planning to cut, Mr. DeSena? So I, I already answered that question. How about that? <laughs> no, um, this is a statement that people have been making. I didn't cut any services at all. And anybody who came to the budget workshop would hear that. There, were, there was nothing cut. Now, when somebody asks, for instance, we had a department, uh, the commissioner of public services asked for more staff, and we asked why. And then he listed the number of service requests. It actually had decreased last year. So for us to ask the taxpayers to take on the responsibility of additional salary, when we had seen a decrease in requests for code enforcement, that didn't, that didn't seem justifiable to me. And when I said, how many staff did, how many code enforcement staff did you have last year? Same amount, same amount. Well, when was it changed? 2011, that was under your administration when the number of code enforcement officers was cut. So I have done nothing to cut that. I have not cut any services. Um, there is no hole in the budget. Thank you. Mr. Kamen. So the town budget is, there's two budgets. There's a general fund and the town outside the village fund. Uh, the general fund budget is increased by about two and a half million dollars under the current budget. But the, the revenue that's coming in is uh, short by six million dollars. It's short by six million dollars because there's three and a half million dollars shortage in, in, in covering the costs of this budget. Usually that's why governments are forced to either raise taxes or hold the line on taxes. The challenge is to reduce expenditure. If you want to cut taxes, you have to reduce expenditure. You don't just increase expenditure and then cut taxes by using reserves. By using reserves, you create, in this case, a $6 million hole in the general fund budget. Well, next year, that's going to go to $8 million. There's no revenue to bring that in. Once you run out of your reserves, you're creating a hole. So inevitably, the government's going to have to cut personnel or services or more in order to cover those holes. So for this year, we can see that you can make an argument that you're going to be covered 
But for next year, the year after that, in the future, uh, and unless someone is going to be raising taxes by 10, 20, 30, 40 percent, you're not going to cover these services. So inevitably, there's no way to have a budget like this that looks beyond this year, which is all that this supervisor's done. She looks at this year, this election. This budget is about this election exclusively. The question is, for the taxpayer, what about the future? And the future is going to have a $6 million hole in one budget. The town outside the village is going to have a $5 million hole. That's $11 million that's not covered next year. And what about the year after that and the year after that and the year after that? Thank you. To continue in this vein, can you please clarify whether John Kamen raised taxes 44% during his 10-year ten tenure, tenure as town supervisor as DeSena States or barely raised them all as Kamen States? Mr. Kamen. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yes, I can. Uh, and the answer is no, we did not raise taxes 44%. Uh, we can go through each year. So each year the town uh, board... Uh, has to vote on a ser series of budgets, but the two main budgets, as I've said, are the general fund budget and the town outside the village budget. Uh, and so I've, uh, we went through each year recently, we published this, by the way, uh, we put it in all the local newspapers and that, and we published it in the newspaper. The first uh, two years, there was a zero increase. Uh, there was no increase in the, in the town, um, in town taxes. I believe the third year we had a $7.50 increase. And what happens is when you're creating a budget, it, it fluctuates up and down. The fourth year it went down a few dollars. The fifth year it went up, I think, $15. Then it would stay the same. Uh, it came down again. Uh, ultimately, out of the nine years that I voted on a budget, four of them had an increase of $6, $7.50. One was $15 and one was, uh, I believe, $15. Total of 40 something dollars. Uh, and so, They've taken a number of dollars, put a percentage sign after it, and decided to create this, this myth that taxes have gone up. Now, I was elected five times. People lived here. They, they saw the budgets. News they wrote about it. They do an analysis of the budget every year. So people would have noticed if that significant increase was happening. What does happen, by the way, is that the county changes uh, its, its taxing uh, levy, the way, it, the way it structures taxes, and every once in a while that would have an impact on budgets. So an individual tax might go up or down. We could even look to the, to the, to the ticket that my opponent is running on, and, and they have a history of raising taxes uh, far beyond anything that Thank she you. could accuse me of. Ms. DeSena. Again, you go to political party, always. Um, but the amount you raise taxes is all sourced. Um, it was $20 million total, and you do the math, it comes out to 44%. The story that you say you wrote, the, the, the source that you say you put out, was put in a fake newspaper called North Hempstead Times. So, and, and I believe that you asked Steve Blank to please research it and write, a, and write a story in his newspaper. I haven't seen that. I've only seen this fake story in something that is intentionally misleading to look like news. Um, and, it's, and it's called the North Hempstead Times. So that's where you explain it. Um, my, my numbers are all sourced. Thank you. We're going to move on to housing and zoning. Uh, how do you ensure that the Board of Zoning Appeals is protecting the policies and zoning code established to protect the town's wealth and health and welfare, Ms. Bassetta. The Board of Zoning Appeals is independent from the town board. So if we were to change something that, I mean, we, if we were to change the zoning, that would be something the town board would have to vote on. We would go to the town attorney to help us. We would ask for assistance from the planning department as well, probably the building commissioner. So if we wanted to make a change, um, we, would, we would have to do that. As far as um, ensuring they're complying, if, if somebody felt that they weren't complying, then, then they would raise that, and they would, they, they would raise that to the town board. Mr. Kamen. Um, yeah, by the way, it's, it's impossible for me to raise taxes $20 million on $60 million budgets. Um, people would have noticed. But the, and it's all sourced by Newsday, by the way, not, not my, my tabloid. Um, the, 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 uh, the, the board that we're speaking of is essentially an appeals board. When someone um, uh, puts an application in for a building permit, if they're outside the code, uh, that application, they can seek a variance. And so that board is an appeals board to appeal the, the, the rejection that they received uh, for their application because that application, again, has been determined by the building department to be outside the code. 
there are limits to what the, the, the Board of Appeals uh, can do. For instance, if it's a use variance, you cannot change the use. So if, if uh, someone has a house and they want to put a business there, they can't get a variance making it a business district. Uh, that's a zoning issue, and the town board would have to change the, the zoning. And so the, the, the Board of Appeals on, on zoning, their, their obligation is to make sure that everybody is treated fairly, that there's a consistency in how their decisions are made, so that if one house is allowed to make a change to their property, other houses similarly situated will be, would be able to make a similar change. Uh, you don't want to see one house going up 20 feet higher and the next house not being allowed to do something. So the idea behind zoning in, in general and the Board of Appeals is to make sure that everybody is being treated fairly and equally. Uh, we've had experience in the past where uh, the uh, building department uh, had troubles. We found that corruption. We, we fixed it. And ultimately, the building department has met a lot of challenges since then, not been fixed. Uh, and so that's really the challenge that we face. Thank you. To follow up, uh, you campaign, or there's been campaign talk about the building department uh, to eliminate the de delays in issuing permits to both residents and businesses, particularly new businesses. Uh, how would you, do you have a plan to improve the building department so that both businesses can open more quickly? And how would you identify and discipline inspectors who violate the town rules or ask for kickbacks? Um, Mr. Kaman. So the building department is, of course, the, the, the department that receives all applications for any change in somebody's home or property. Uh, years ago, I put in a new system called 311 Townstat. That system was a computer system that ultimately changed the way we documented all input uh, into the town. That system, upon being installed, ultimately led us to finding uh, uh, things in the building department that were ultimately found to be illegal. We turned over the entire... Uh, information that we received to the district attorney's office. They prosecuted and found some bad guys. We then had to fix the billing department. It took several years to go through the investigation. What I would do now is because the billing department does and is capable of making sure that it does it properly because of the systems that we put in, and it's been doing so ever since, it has been delayed in its ability to issue permits. And that delay causes uh, costs to go up for homeowners or businesses that are trying to open up a business. Excuse me. I would... I would add plans examiners. I would add uh, uh, certainly one, possibly two. I would add building inspectors. I would uh, make sure that we use e-permitting and other technologies. Uh, I would take responsibility, unlike my opponent. My opponent got into office two years ago, and the first thing, and everything she says, even in her opening, is that uh, she asked the county uh, controller's office to please bail her out on this and do an investigation. It's been two years. Nothing's happened. When I'm in office, I take responsibility. We, we find out what the problem is. You go to the stakeholders. I would go to the architects and the engineers and the civic leaders and the community and find out what are the problems that you're facing. The challenges that we have to, we, is when we have someone who has a problem on one, and my time is up, but I'd be more than happy to continue that uh, discussion on the building department when I can. Appreciate it, Mr. Senna. So on the one hand, my opponent says that he fixed the problems in the building department. And on the other hand, he says, why didn't I fix the problems in the building department yet? So clearly there are problems. Everybody still talks about them. Not a day goes by that I don't hear some complaint. Why does it take so long? I don't feel like I'm getting fair treatment. You know, can I intervene? Now, I think that's the problem is that for 15 years, the town board has not addressed the building department, has not made them accountable they benefit by being able to exert control, either to make something happen or not make something happen. So, no, it's very hard to fix it in two years, especially when um, the town board doesn't want to help. So, we need to make the building department accountable. It's funny because the 311 system actually can be a wall so that people can't reach the building department. In other towns, an architect or a builder can call the building department and speak to the inspector or speak to the examiner. In our town, they can't. They get stuck in 311. So we need to make the personnel more accountable. That's something I've been trying to do. Um, I have held some people accountable in the building department, and I'm going to continue to try and do more. Thank you. Ms. DeSena, what will you do about housing for people who live in Spinney Hill and can't get apartments? The affordable housing in our town has 10 plus year waiting lists. Do you think this is urgent? I think that the waiting list is, is, it is too long. 
Um, this town does not have adequate affordable housing. I do think that other towns have done better in the past. Um, the town needs to have a variety of housing stock. I propose to update our master plan. It hasn't been done in 30 years. And when we do that, we will do it with community input. We will look for the places that are appropriate for building multifamily apartments. That means there have to be sewers available. We have to look at parking. We have to uh, look at schools, electricity, drinking water, all these things have to be studied before you can say this area is, is appropriate for multifamily housing. So um, I believe we need to update the master plan and identify places where we can have more affordable housing because yes, the waiting list is too long. Mr. Kamen. Uh, so my, my opponent put out a, piece, a mailer uh, criticizing me for uh, saying that communities should have multifamily housing, uh, which is generally apartments or uh, could be garden apartments, could be anything that's other than single family housing. Um, the ha housing challenge is real. Uh, to start off a campaign, and, and by the way, the, the, the supervisor is the incumbent, and so she's talking as if this is what she might do if she, if she were elected. The, the, the challenge when you're responsible is to go out and, and one, educate the community, engage the community, find out where their opportunities exist uh, so that uh, the community can elevate their uh, housing stock in a way that makes sense. Could be around transit-oriented development, which is train stations. Uh, it could be in areas that are uh, formerly industrial or, or business. Uh, there are options, but it is always a challenge. And so housing in our community um, is, is, is difficult because in many ways we're built out. And so the way our roadways are, are built, whether our, we could provide services such as water and uh, garbage, uh, sanitation pickup, and uh, all the other things that go into uh, determining whether or not you can increase density. Density is the, is the determination of how many people you can put on a piece of property. And so this is a real challenge. Uh, it's something that I've done and navigated when I was supervisor. Uh, it's something I will continue to do. Uh, people certainly uh, need more housing. If there's more housing, costs would go down. Uh, but it is a challenge in a community that's usually, uh, or that is built out, such as North Hempstead. So I'm going to give both of you a little bit more time to talk about this particular issue by reading this question. A recent campaign ad by Supervisor DeSena claims that John Kamen uh, wants to ram through, quote, Bronx-style multifamily housing. Mr. Kamen, is this true? Ms. DeSena, what evidence do you have for this claim? And why did you use the term Bronx-style, Mr. Kamen? Yeah, well, we can uh, imagine what they meant by that, and, and well, I'm curious to hear the answer as well. Um, the, the, it's not true because there's nothing, you know, Bronx is its own community. They have their own ability to decide their housing, and, and the people there are uh, capable of making their decisions, and, and we tip our hat to them to figure out how they want to uh, govern themselves. Uh, North Hempstead uh, does not have uh, levels of public transportation uh, and the ability to generate housing on the scale uh, that can be done in the boroughs in New York City. And so, no, we can never build the size and scope of housing uh, in uh, a place like North Hempstead. We can build additional housing. There can be multifamily housing. Uh, but it has to be done in a way that's consistent with the quality and character of the, of the communities in which we want to build. Uh, it is, and, and that information is, is really the... Uh, the environmental impact. The environmental impact is is not just air and water. It's it's in egress, ingress. It's the traffic. It's the it's the impact on schools. It's all the things that go into uh, making a decision as to how we construct something in our community. And so, you know, I believe that uh, that that piece was meant to do exactly what they hoped it would do: is to try to turn people against me and scare people. Uh, you know, my opponent is is running on a party of grievance and fear, and uh, this is the thing they do. There's 30, 40 mailings similar in nature. So if this is their style. This is who they are. Mr. Senator. And again, I'm labeled uh, by a, by a party. Um, first of all, there's nothing wrong with the Bronx. I was born there. My family all grew up there, and um, but then they decided to go buy a single family home in Massapequa. So that's what they bought, that's their investment, a single family home. The Bronx is great, um, but if you bought a single family home in a community with all single family homes, that's what you expected, that's what you invested in, and it shouldn't change 
with a stroke of a pen. What you proposed when your supervisor was that accessory dwelling units would be legal all throughout the town. You can't do all of that at once. You can't, you can't have this one size fits all approach everywhere at once. We would not be able to keep up with the resources we need. And you had a tremendous pushback from residents and you rightfully pulled it because the town of North Hempstead didn't want that. But this came way before Governor Hochul's approach. And so yes, it was a reminder that you had proposed it once before. You probably will be very uh, sympathetic, welcoming to that again. Thank you. Mr. Senate, given the worsening climate crises, what is your plan to address both the resiliency and sustainability of the town of uh, North Hempstead? Please be specific, well, specific. What is your position on shoreline development given threats of storm surge and flooding? Um, we actually, we have been applying, we, we received a grant for that to improve our shoreline. Um, and there is a plan to, to improve the shoreline at North Hempstead Beach Park. Um, we have a wonderful Climate Smart Communities um, Task Force that includes many stakeholders in the community, environmental experts, and uh, we, we do consider what, what we can do as the town, how we can educate better. Um, we did advocate for a, a large, we asked for a large grant from the federal government to try and um, build better when we redo the Port Washington dock to make that more resilient, you know, with, with greens. Um, unfortunately, we didn't get that one. Um, but uh, my team has applied for uh, many grants to try and, you know, those are expensive items, those uh, resiliency, um, you know, to, to redo North Hempstead Beach Park, it's expensive. So that $1 million, I, I don't believe it has been used yet, and um, I believe it is, does require a match. So the town of North Hempstead, I believe, is on the forefront of this. Um, we do have a shoreline to protect. We have seen flooding. So uh, we will continue to do whatever we can to try and uh, get the funds to, to make our coast safe. When I was town supervisor, uh, I applied for many grants, and I won many grants, bringing in 50, 60 million dollars um, of grants, federal and state grants. Uh, many of which were the environmental grants. We've restored wetlands, we've restored ponds and waterways uh, through those grants. The key to getting those grants, the, the, the way you win those grants is by understanding how this all works, and that is you need to be able to invest your own local monies into, into it as well. You need to provide the match, and that match is significant. So if you offer the match, but if you defund your government and you, you have no money to give a match, then you're not going to be able to get these awards. So the reason why we kept taxes stable and didn't raise them very high, but they didn't go very low, we didn't cut it all out one year to win an election, and the reason why you need to have that money is so that when you are applying for a grant, when you're trying to deal with the crisis that you're facing, a climate is an ongoing crisis, you can put in a million dollars and get $10 million. And so we took the money that we had and we made it $10 million, $20 million, $30 million more by being able to invest wisely, by, by understanding how government works. Climate action requires that we understand that most of uh, the, the, the greenhouse gases, uh, the, the carbon footprint that we create in our town comes from transportation and it comes from buildings. And so what I would do and continue to do is change our building codes, uh, which I've done when I was there, but now there's new technologies to, to keep more of the greenhouse gases in, uh, in the buildings and to make sure that uh, we are reducing the amount that are leaching out. Uh, I would invest in, in, in the time to make sure that we uh, restore that. I would also make sure that we go to electric vehicles and reduce the carbon uh, greenhouse gases coming from transportation. Thank you. If elected, what criteria would you use? Uh, what if would you ever consider giving away town park land through the Park Alienation Act? If so, what process would you use, and how would you work with residents uh, to initiate a state environmental quality uh, review act process, Mr. Kamen? So no, I would not uh, uh, de-alienate uh, parkland. Uh, parkland is precious. 
Uh, we don't have enough of it, and so we should preserve everything we have. I actually acquired new parks. My, my opponent was critical of me for that, but the, uh, we partnered with, Na with uh, Nassau County uh, to acquire a number of parks so that we can make sure they were preserved uh, and invest in them. So we built ball fields on them, and we restored some of the natural environment in those parks. Uh, we've maintained them as open space. And the goal for a town such as ours is to maintain open space. So that to use parks for building future development is, is not the answer, uh, and I would not support it. Um, I would not plan on giving away parkland. Um, it would be something we should almost never do, but, but we, obviously we would consider it, um, consider every situation as it comes up. Um, but you mentioned that, you know, that you, you, you mentioned that you did all this work, but why is North Hempstead Beach Park still not done? Nothing has been done. You took that on to help uh, then County Executive Swazi make his looks his books look better, but you took on all these parks without the money to maintain them. They were not in good condition, so you transferred the responsibility of the county onto the town without the funds to take care of it. So, you know, you say you invested all this money, but, but it's not done. With the large increase in traffic on major, and ta major town roads and the mixed ownership of roads between the town and the county, how do you plan to improve pedestrian and child safety in the town, Ms. Dezena? Well, we will be having a, uh, we'll have the opportunity to finally address um, Planned on Road right at Town Hall in Manhasset. Um, that is an area that has been neglected for many, many years. I happen to live in Manhasset, so I know how long the residents have been asking for increased, you know, improvements for the pedestrians. Um, but, but finally, we are going to be able to install sewers in the planned on business district, and when they are completed, we will finally repave that road and redo the sidewalks. And so the ideas that have been circulated, proposed by the town board for, you know, I would say maybe the 24 years that I've lived in Manhasset, uh, we will finally get to do something. Um, we have to be, we have to prioritize our pedestrians in our downtowns. Restaurants and small businesses are the backbone of our town. So um, we will always try and make make them safe for pedestrians. Obviously, we all moved here for our, the safety of our families. Um, so we will focus on the pedestrian crossings, improving safety. And um, when we revitalize our downtowns and help small businesses open there, we, we help our tax base and we keep the town of North Hempstead a desirable place to move. Thank you, Mr. Kamen. Yeah, when she's gonna get around to doing that, I guess we'll see. Uh, but uh, you might remember that when I was town supervisor and, and I've not been there for 10 years and so, uh, 10 years ago and 20 years ago, when I was there, there will be uh, some impact on the, the time in between. Um, the way you keep people safe is by making sure that we apply our codes and our laws. Uh, I actually did a visioning in Manhasset. We had the whole community come out. Uh, you might have been active in, the, in, in civics at that time, but that was about 12 or 14 years ago, and we ended up rechanging the whole planned home road corridor. And we did it with all the input of, of not just engineers and, and, and planners, but with the community, the community leaders, the civic association, uh, the chamber of commerce. And we made changes to make it safer. We narrowed the road, uh, we added crosswalks, we put in uh, special places to park so that you can actually widen the uh, sidewalks in certain areas. It doesn't mean, and we actually put a right-hand turn lane in, in one area so that we can get traffic away uh, and then uh, uh, hold people up. And so we've been doing it, and that's, that comes down to uh, planning and communicating with your community and doing and getting results. I would also uh, keep people safe by getting families to know that they go into the parks. And when I was in charge, we invested in our parks. We fixed our parks. We put ball fields. You look at any single park that I took over or I maintained, 20, 30 parks, every single one of them had improvements, including North Hempstead Beach Park. We put two uh, fields in there. Uh, we redid the walkways. We actually acquired half the park from the county, and we've invested in, in numerous ways. We brought in rowing. We brought in others, and the parks were spectacular. We were one of the top 100 places to live in America, and our parks were recognized for being so. Mr. Kamen, what is the status of sewers on Plandome Road and in the Bayview and Shorehaven areas? Weren't they supposed to be paid for from COVID funds and grants? Uh, in general, in terms of the town's quality of life, do you support 
increasing sewer lines given our water issues? Uh, yes, I do support uh, putting sewers in. Sewers are actually environmentally friendly. It's better to have sewers than septic, uh, especially when you're a waterfront community. So sewers are a good idea. Um, I actually looked into sewers when I was town supervisor, uh, and there were challenges in getting there, and, and, and I uh, do believe that uh, this is a project that should go forward. I would include the school district. I'm surprised that the school's not included. Uh, uh, they, spe they spend a fortune uh, in septic, and uh, the school district and the residents would actually benefit. Right now, the proposal is to put the sewer line down Plan Dome Road and the, to use ARPA monies, federal dollars, to give each business owner, who may or may not be a resident, resident of the town, $30,000 or whatever it costs for them to make that connection. Not a bad incentive to make sure everyone participates, but that's not necessarily helping the larger community. I would make sure that if we're gonna invest in sewers, that some of that money that we're giving away actually helps the residents by connecting the school district. Uh, residents uh, taxes would actually be affected in a positive way because the school would have to spend less money. Ms. Desetta. The school does not want to connect because they already did Things, things took so long, it, nothing was happening. They already did invest in a, in a huge uh, septic system. So if and when that uh, needs replacing, I don't know, 30 years, they can hook up to the sewer. Uh, they just have chosen not to do it now. They could not wait any longer. Uh, so um, we, will, we are actually even starting to talk to the Great Neck Water Pollution Control District about the residents. Um, homes are interested in knowing how much they would have to pay. So uh, we, we believe that we may have created a model here um, working with the Great Neck Pollution Control District that, uh, that we might even expand to homes, which many, 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 many homeowners know that um, you know, the, the cesspools are just not environmentally sustainable. Um, and, they're, and they're spending money every year. So um, I look forward to continuing to work with all the stakeholders um, and the county and the state representatives to, to find the money so that, so that we can you know, get, get current, uh, try and catch up to the rest of the world with sewers. Thank you. Supervisor to Senate, and I'm reading this as verbatim as possible. You endorsed George Santos, a election denier who did not renounce those who attacked the Capitol and who called for a national ban on abortion. Your running mate, Dave Franklin, refused to affirm the existence of climate change at last week's candidate forum and as promoting a fake news story about asylum seekers being dropped off at a local train station. What are your views on those matters and how do you characterize your support of Santos and Franklin? Mr. Kamen, when it is your turn, if a member of your party, uh, promoted positions with which you did not agree, how would you address that, Ms. DeSena? I was a victim, just like everyone else, of George Santos's lies. Um, I assumed that people had vetted him. I assumed that his opponents running for Congress had vetted him. This man had been running for Congress for three years against Tom Swasey and then against uh, John Kamen and, and Robert Zimmerman and, and Josh Lafasan. So for someone to have not gone to college, uh, I, I was flabbergasted when this was revealed by the New York Times. Um, I wish that that information had been revealed earlier so that we all could have made a better choice. Um, so once I did find out, I... I called for him to resign. I called on the House to expel him. I have not spoken to him. Um, but I'll say that he was elected because people wanted tax relief. I mean, the, the, you know, everybody knew that he was an election denier. They all, they all voted for him. That's not because of me. Everybody knew that fact. That had nothing to do with me. Um, so I did call for, for him to resign. Um, and I would contrast that with how you handled Gerard Terry. You, you still supported him. And even after he was convicted of fraud, of, of a fraud on our own residents in the town of North Hempstead, you asked for leniency for him. So, uh, you know, I'm, I, have no, I have no further connection to uh, George Santos and um, the things that he stands for. Mr. Kamen. 
So it's interesting you refer to his positive attribute of looking for tax relief, and maybe that's why you support him and others. Maybe we should not be blindly following people who just declare tax relief as the answer for all our problems without going to the underlying problems, without even caring what the underlying problems are. She supported, she supported uh, George Santos after he stood on the steps of the Capitol and said that the 2020 election was a fraud. And after he took his positions on abortion and guns and all these other things, he was out there for two years. He was a, a congressional candidate two years earlier. And so she declared that he was her friend and a true leader and a person that she trusted. She vouched for him. She put herself out there. She, she campaigned with him. She told us to vote for him. This is who our leader is supposed to be. She's responsible. We're responsible for our acts. And so it's always, always, always somebody else is responsible. She's a victim, the town board, and this person, that person's not letting her do something. I'm sorry, but you're running for the executive of one of the largest towns in the United States of America. Take responsibility for something. And so when I look at what happened and you talk to somebody who was charged with some level of tax fraud, um, that person went to trial, went to jail, whatever it was. And by the way, no, I did not write a letter asking for leniency. We were asked to write a letter explaining who this person was and things that they did. And I did that because that's who I am. And so I have no problem sharing the good and the bad about people. This is not just a polarized or polar decision-making world where we can't see that, that, that difference in people. But that's not what was going on here. And so the question was about George Santos. If I have a problem with somebody, I confront them, I address it, I engage, and take responsibility when I am responsible for, for, doing the, for the decisions that I make. Thank you. Now, sorry to have laid a trap for you. Residents are being flooded with negative attack ads and mailers, and we are sick of it. Uh, given the dysfunction of our government uh, on our federal level and town board, what is the secret ingredient that you would use to work across the aisle and get things done, bring civility back to town meetings, and in general, positive things that you're campaigning for, uh, Ms. Mr. Gannon? So when I was town supervisor, we had a Republican and then Republicans on the board. And I would have a Democratic caucus, which is when we sit with one side of the aisle, because you're allowed to do that. In fact, you're encouraged to do that, because there's strategic reasons why people uh, vote and, and make decisions. And so it's important to be able to communicate with that. But I also would have a caucus with the two Republicans on the board. And I would sit down with them, and I would go over, these are my plans. This is why I'm doing it. This is how much it costs. This is why this is the community that it's in. And I would go into that community with them. And even if I disagree with them or they disagree with me, I would still share their disagreement in an honest and forward way. And so that way there was no misinformation or misimpression that was created. And sometimes they voted with me and sometimes they voted against me. And when I went into various communities and there's communities that were, were, were frustrated with maybe uh, a particular issue and they thought that it was political because I might be on the Democratic side and my opponent uh, or the, the, whoever it was years ago was against me and was on another party. Uh, we would get into the issues and talk about the substance of what we're trying to put forward. Because at the end of the day, when you're talking about local government, when you're talking about building roads and, 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 and putting in a stop sign or getting garbage picked up, it's not Republican or Democrat. But when you run for office, we run under a party banner. And so when you start adopting national ideas, defunding a government, because the idea is that if we take all the money out of government, there'll be less things to do. That is a policy that's, that, that, that stops from the top down, and that's what, I, that's what I oppose. So you're defending the, this political caucus. Why? Why do we have to have a political caucus in town hall? Why do we have to have strategy? Why would you have to speak with different council members differently based on what party they're with? What strategy is there? I think the public just wants us to spend their money carefully. We're talking about paving roads and improving parks and pools and, and trying to make our building department work better. Why do we have to have strategy Democratic or Republican strategy. There's something now called the New York State Open Meetings Law, and it says that a board you, you can't meet unless you you know unless it's open to the public. Now, the Democrats on the board, there are four of them. That's a quorum. Why do they have to meet separately? So I have been saying, why don't we notice our meetings? Why aren't they open to the public as the New York State Open Meetings Law requires? Well, I hear there's an exception for political caucus. Why? And, why, and, and is it a political caucus when you have required all the commissioners and department heads to come and attend and then you ask them questions and you're talking about government business, this is a political caucus, and then I'm expected to have my own private meeting with the two Republicans 
Now we double the amount of time that our commissioners are spending asking questions. Why would we do that when we can just have one meeting open to the public and we can ask our commissioners questions and we don't talk politics? Thank you. Right, no clapping, please. Thank you. Hold your applause. We're going to talk about cats. This is the only town on Long Island with no cat shelter. Cats are multiplying out of control in the streets. What are each of you going to do to alleviate the horrible suffering of these defenseless creatures, Ms. Mazzetta? Um, we, are, we are looking at uh, creating a voucher program. This is something we approved at our last meeting. We have had amazing advocates for the cats. They are out there doing this as volunteers. They come to our meetings every month and they ask us to do better. So we have approved, we're, we're going to look into a voucher program. Um, we can look into improving our trap and neuter program. Um, our town does not have a cat shelter because under my opponent, the plan to build one, which was bonded for, was canceled. And I don't know why. So our shelter is only for dogs. I don't know why, but the amount of money it would take to build a cat shelter or to make our, our current dog shelter um, appropriate for cats is a tremendous amount of money. It's a huge policy decision that, that this board would have to um, agree on. So um, we will continue to find ways to um, address kittens being born. And um, you know, in the meantime, I thank these advocates for uh, for all for all they do as volunteers and for continuing to to ask us to do better. And they have asked their state leaders as well. Um, why does the state only require a dog shelter? That's what the state does, and it's you know because dogs can bite and really hurt. Um, so thank you for your advocacy. Uh, Mr. Uh, so if you're looking for future monies to go to spay and neuter and helping address cats. Uh, don't look for this government to do it because she's cutting all the funding that you're going to need to use it for. That's why you don't uh, withdraw and wipe out all your revenue. Um, you spend your money wisely, as we did. We actually built the addition to the uh, animal shelter. Uh, and so I'm sorry that you don't know what happened or why. But the uh, reality was we built the addition to the uh, animal shelter. Uh, we did not convert it to a cat shelter because the, under New York Agriculture and Markets Law, when you bring in an animal, you are not allowed to let that animal leave unless it's adopted. And so you have to either adopt it, hold it, or euthanize it. And many of the cat shelters uh, around Long Island and around the country tend to euthanize a significant number of cats, and we did not want to do that. And so we spent uh, literally a million dollars or more on growing a program for spay and neuter. We hired private uh, companies to come in, uh, and we had vans, we, had, we hired actually a company to go out and uh, trap and spray and neuter, and so that is uh, really, I believe, uh, the primary answer. Can we uh, look to use some our new building or the portion of the building that's not new anymore uh, for cats? I told the people who uh, I've spoken to about it that I will keep an open mind. I will have those discussions, as I always have, and I will uh, hear people out and make a determination with them and mine as stakeholders and along with the other board members and the rest of the community to decide if that's something we want to do. But it, uh, the, it is a concern. Thank you. Why has Newcastle been neglected for the past two years? It's never had full services, but recent budget cuts or something have meant no services. A balanced budget or reduction in taxes means nothing to residents who feel unseen and not respected. What will you com commit to going forward? Please be specific, Mr. Kamen. So I, I put a great deal of effort into uh, Newcastle. Uh, it is an extraordinary, vibrant uh, community, and uh, it had been uh, ignored for years. Uh, when I came in, I partnered with some of the local leaders there. We ended up building the Yes We Can Community Center, a $26 million, 80,000 square foot platinum lead certified uh, building uh, that, is, that stands today, and it's an extraordinary building. We rebuilt Prospect Avenue. We built housing, uh, multifamily housing, affordable housing. Uh, we partnered with the Housing Authority to improve the actual uh, housing that uh, they're responsible for, which was uh, lower income housing. Uh, and uh, we also engaged the community uh, in ways to do visionings and other such things. Visioning meaning that we brought the community in. 
uh, to, to get a better feeling for what they needed. And one of the things they wanted was to have minority-owned businesses in a minority community. And so we invested dollars that we had so that we can invest into that community. And so then there was a, a minority-owned delicatessen or a minority-owned store and a minority-owned dentist. And that's a way that people can feel pride in their own community, uh, invest in their own community. And I would continue, of course, to do that uh, were I the supervisor again. However, if you take away all the revenue of the town, you blow $11 million hole in your budget just to win an election, then you're not gonna have the ability to invest in communities, to participate in other communities, to do the planning and the, bring in the expertise and invest in those things that are necessary for that community and every community in this town. Mr. Sam. There is no $11 million hole in the budget. I mean, you keep saying this, but there, there is nothing of the sort. We still have reserves at 30% which is what the ratings agencies want. So I, I, don't, know, I don't know why you keep saying that. Um, but in Newcastle, we have done amazing work. We have um, um, rebuilt, uh, I think, 20 houses now that uh, we've acquired through, um, through redevelopment programs. Um, and they also include a down payment. So we, we've and this is not me, I'm not taking credit, it's our CDA, it's Rosemary Olson. They do incredible work with grants and they're able to rebuild these houses um, so a family can move in and, and use the wonderful Westbury School District and the wonderful Yes We Can Center, which has uh, programs for kids, you know, right through, the, you know, right till the end of the night, they can be there. So I'm always looking to um, work with the stakeholders and, and hear what more we can do. And our, we have a very good grant writing team who, who has been really successful in bringing money to Newcastle for uh, renovations. So I, I'll continue to support them. And I'm gonna have two questions left probably. Do you agree or disagree with the current Nassau County supervisor who opposes evaluating or changing the current reassessment values and highly re highly profitable reassessment appeals process. Is there a better way, and if so, what is it, Ms. Vicenna? Um, I guess you mean the county executive? Um, yeah, probably. They have um, frozen taxes. Again, they, they did a study of the reassessment that was begun under the prior county executive. Um, they found that there were so many mistakes in the reassessment that it, it had not been ready. Um, it was done the reassessment was begun also um, during the pandemic. And so now, you know, we're, we're in like a five-year phase in, except they have frozen the roles. So it's, it's very difficult because with the, tech, with the roles frozen, the people who feel that they're paying too much are also stuck. Um, we have so many people who are grieving their taxes. Um, you know, it's a, this is something very complicated and, um, um, you know, I'm not. I'm not going to say uh, you know that I know better than than the than the reassessor as to uh, as to how we how we get there. But we'll continue to work with the county and make sure that um, we advocate on behalf of our residents. Mr. Kane. So the assessment process has been a disaster for for decades, and the industry, the the attorneys that 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 win have dedicated tens of millions of dollars, donated tens of millions of dollars uh, to the Republican Party. And the result is that every time the Republican Party is in charge of the county, uh, they have these extreme winners and losers. And so 50% of the people in the county uh, challenge their assessment and win, uh, or of the people that challenge, win, they win. And the other 50 have to pay for the amount that the, the people that won uh, are, are, are saving. So if, if, for, if, if X million dollars goes, uh, goes down in, in taxes because the people who challenged them win, all the people that didn't challenge them, their taxes go up because the levy stays the same. And so this is a system that's meant just to promote the lawyers. The lawyers are making hundreds of millions of dollars. It's a handful of firms. Uh, they benefit from it. And so as long as the system stays broken, then all this money flows to the politics and it's their interest 
to 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 suppress uh, the, the, uh, to suppress the, the any change. I believe that ultimately the town should take responsibility and not to do assessment. That's a county function, but the town should make sure that through uh, money is coming from the county, and the county can afford to do this because ultimately they would save money uh, if they did assessment correctly. Uh, have the town do some type of uh, analysis of assessment uh, through a smaller office that would be able to ultimately make sure that the assessments were fair. Uh, and that's the key thing. We need to have fair assessment in, in our county, in our town, in every town. Thank you. And this is going to be the final question. What are three positive things and changes that we can judge your performance on as you campaign, Mr. Kamen? Uh, you can judge me on my record. You know, I've served in various roles in government uh, at the county level, at the state level uh, as a judge. You could look at who I am and what I've done, what I say. Uh, you could look at my responses and you could look at the results that I've achieved uh, as a town supervisor. Uh, the things I've created, like Project Independence and bringing 311 to the town, uh, putting in new systems so we can find when people are breaking the rules and hold them accountable. Uh, the things that, that I have done have been very public. You know, I do it in a way uh, that brings in all the stakeholders. It's not just about showing up to the event and then figuring out uh, who else can be responsible. It's about showing up to places, including the people who are impacted in the discussion, finding the experts, investing resources so that we get correct answers, so that we use science and expertise and people who are committed to getting results. That's what I've always done. And so I would simply say, look at my record uh, and look at who I am uh, as, uh, as an official and the success that I've had. Uh, and I think people will see that my words uh, ring true. As a reminder, we're almost done, so keep your phones off. Um, Ms. Desena. Um, I've brought a collaborative approach to being the supervisor. Um, I, and it's funny because when I was running for supervisor, I was criticized once because I said that I think listening is important. Well, I do. Um, so, uh, one of the things I've created is a substance misuse task force, um, because there, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot that's hurting our families, killing our children. And, um, so, you know, it's, it's, different than zoning and uh, zoning is something that's very important to our town and protect, protecting our zoning and um, making sure that our investments remain what they were when we bought our home in, in North Hempstead. But um, quality of life also includes uh, the safety of our families and, and mental health. So um, I've, brought, I've brought some of my prior experience to uh, my conversations with communities. Um, I was very involved in many nonprofits before I ran for supervisor, and so I tend to reach out to stakeholders and um, meet with the, the uh, you know, the clergy, the chambers of commerce, the civic associations, um, also the mayors. We have 31 mayors in the town of North Hempstead, and I've spent a lot of time with the mayors because they're also our residents, and uh, the mayors tend to know their village residents' needs even better. So. Um, that's a, a positive change I think I've brought. Thank you. Now, before we take closing statements for the candidates, I would like to remind voters that Election Day is Tuesday, November 7th at your regular polling place. Early voting begins on Saturday, October 28th and runs through Sunday, November 5th. During early voting, you can vote early at any of the 27 early polling sites in Nassau County. This forum is being broadcast by North Shore TV, which will rebroadcast it in the next weeks. A recording of this form will also be available on the LWV of PWM YouTube channel within the week. So before we go on to closing statements, let's please offer applause to both candidates for their willingness to answer questions together on the same stage. Ms. Desenner, you're first. Okay. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight, we've had the chance to discuss the future of North Hempstead. And I want to thank you all for your engagement and attention to local issues, as these are often the issues that make the most difference on our lives. Uh, throughout the evening, I've talked about some of my accomplishments from my first term as supervisor, many of which were attained despite an openly hostile town board majority. I have a vision for the future of North Hempstead, a vision built on a foundation of leadership and genuine commitment to the well-being of our residents not to the preservation of political power. 
My track record as town supervisor speaks to my dedication to this community, and I'm not just here to make promises, I'm here to deliver results. I've worked tirelessly to offer millions of dollars in taxpayer relief, improve our town's infrastructure, increase transparency, enhance environmental sustainability, and support our local businesses. My opponent has made a career out of raising your taxes. Taxes went up over $20 million under his watch, and during that time, he voted to give himself a 33% pay raise. Beyond this, corruption ran rampant in this town under his watch, including numerous arrests and jail time in the building department, as well as his personal secretary embezzling nearly $100,000 from the town. He can deny these facts, but they are all sourced from publicly available documents and data. It's the cold, hard truth. If all that isn't enough, he's shown he's willing to sacrifice our quality of life as he proposed a housing plan eerily similar to Governor Hochul's before he ultimately scrapped it due to the immense resident pushback. I came into office and vowed to run this town with a taxpayer first principle, and I've done that by cutting taxes and providing millions in taxpayer relief. I ask for your support because I've demonstrated my dedication to North Hempstead time and again. With your help, we can build a North Thank Hempstead you. that is Thank stronger. You, everyone. Mr. Kamen, would you begin your closing statement? So thank you for the opportunity to present tonight. And you can see by the closing statement of my opponent that the words don't ring true. It's all platitudes, it's, it's attacks, there's, there's no truth in it. And by saying it's source doesn't mean it's source. By saying she's a leader doesn't make her a leader. By saying that she gets things done, she's done nothing. Her, her big accomplishment is she appointed four people to the ethics board and none of them got appointed. There's nothing that's actually real in what she says. That's a disaster for this town. And so I'm running based on the truth as to what I've done. And it's all, talk about being source, it's all there. People have lived it. If you look at their articles about my, my budget every year, it'll tell you how much the taxes went up. To make up a number, $20 million, it's an easy thing to say when you're lying. And when you lie, it's, 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 it sounds easy. And, and so you, George Santos, this is who you people are. It's, it's, it's a shame, it's disgusting. It's, it's amazing that you would have this, the gall to sit here and say those things when they're patently untrue. Now, when you look, when you look at the, the history of this town, when you look at the success that we have, when you look at the rating agencies, what they've said about my administration, uh, conservative budgeting, balanced budgets, when you look at what Newsday said, who's endorsed me, when you look at the League of Conservation Voters and the Sierra Club uh, who are looking for environmental uh, support, they've endorsed me. When you look at Planned Parenthood, they've endorsed me. When you look at Gun Sense America, Moms Demand Action, they've endorsed me. And the Long Island Federation of Labor and, and dozens and dozens of other folks who have come out to support me, the controllers, senators, uh, local officials, leaders, people who have been around, who take responsibility, who understand that what you say actually matters. You don't get to just sit there and attack and send out 30, 40 attack pieces of mail and think they're true because you said it. When you say it, that doesn't make it true. Truth actually happens before the words come out of your mouth. And so this is the problem that we have in America today. This is the problem we have locally. When, when she talks about politics being bad, except the political world that she's coming from is, is, is one where you can say anything you want, elect anything you want, and you have no responsibility. The notion that she has an $11 million hole in her budget doesn't even know it, as far as we can tell. Doesn't even understand it. And the and the various issues that are out there, I, I hope people will uh, support me on Election Day. Thank you for your Thank time. You. Thank you to both candidates. <laughs> to, to the candidates, I have a few more words. Uh, the League appreciates your willingness to answer questions from voters thoughtfully and candidly and in sometimes civil discourse with your challenger. And we salute your commitment to serving your fellow citizens by running to serve in this office. Thank you again. I also want to thank the women's group of the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Shelter Rock for co-sponsoring this forum, as well as North Shore TV for broadcasting it. And last thank you, I want to thank you also everyone in the audience for your thoughtful questions, for spending the evening educating yourselves about both candidates, and for your engagement with democracy. Voters like you keep our democracy thriving. This forum for Town of North Hempstead Supervisors now ended.